Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is based on an article I saw essentially saying that the future of love drugs is coming our way and I was like what? So I wanted to do a little video today on what can science tell us about love and do we think we could ever make a love drug? So let's get to it. First thing that I wanted to talk about with the science of love is attraction and spark. Because the first thing that normally happens when you are falling for someone is you feel that initial mm, attraction to them. Attraction can be mediated by many different things, like the amount of time you spend with someone. It could also be mediated by how similar they are to people you've been attracted to in the past, how alike they are to you, plus if they make you feel good if they trigger that sort of feel good sensation and this could be something as simple as they could smell like someone who in the past you've smelled and you like them so there are many different cues around us that can lead us to be attracted to a certain person and then if you go beyond just attraction there is that connection as well the spark that you feel when you are with someone it could be the case that if you're on I don't know, any dating app online, you could be on Tinder, Bumble, whatever. You could have a person there who is your exact cup of tea. They take every single box and then you meet them in person and it just isn't right. And what is missing there is sometimes called the spark. A spark is essentially what we use as a meter, a measure of if this person is right for us. It's like a signal to say, yes, this is the right thing. Go for this person. What that spark is, yeah, scientists have been a little bit perplexed by what actually causes that connection. And there was a study done in 2021 to try and investigate this using a blind date setup. So what this experiment did was they brought couples in together who'd never seen each other before. They were all single. There was over 100 people involved in the experiment. And they put the couples into two little booths with a partition in the middle. And then what they did was they put the partition down and let the people look at each other for a few seconds before it went up again. And this allowed them to rate each other purely based on physical attraction. They then had a few minutes of speaking to each other face to face. And then they had a few minutes of just staring at each other, non-verbal communication. And after those experiences, they rated each other on attraction again. And all of this was done while participants were wearing heart rate monitors, they were tracking sweat on their palms, they were wearing goggles that checked where their eye movements went. And at the end of all these experiments, what the researchers found was if these people felt a connection, it wasn't the humor, it wasn't attractiveness, it wasn't even eye contact that gave people the spark. It was if two people's heart rates synced up. So if two people had similar heart rates during their interactions, they were more likely to report feeling a spark. So this is not saying go on a date and tell your other half to wear a heart rate monitor and then you can check you know, if you're matching up and that's a sign that it's good. What the researchers said essentially was synchronicity between two individuals is seen when people are being emotionally open and available. So the researchers said that if you are more open emotionally on a first date and if both people bring that to the table, you might be more likely to feel that connection or spark with someone. The next phase of love that we have to talk about is obsession. Obsession, because it is sort of an inevitable part of the falling in love process that either if you are seeing a person, you can become obsessed with them, or even if you're not seeing someone and you just really, really like them, they can sort of capture all your attention and they can be all you think about. It's like that person's on the brain day and night. Now, when I was in year nine, I was obsessed with a boy in my school, obsessed with him. And I used to know his class's timetable, right? This makes me sound really weird, but I have this type of memory where I used to know where every class was in my year at all times during the week because I don't know why. So I knew every Monday afternoon between fifth and sixth period, our classes would cross over in the corridor, the English corridor, because they'd be going to geography and I'd be going up to Spanish. So I had this one crossover every week and I would look forward to that every single week with the chance of this boy smiling at me. And I could just be like, hiya. It's not normal behavior, is it? It's not normal, but 
We all do it, it happens to the best of us when we are falling in love, we get obsessed. A particular hormone has been implicated in this feeling of obsession, which is serotonin. So serotonin is a neuromodulator, it's found in the brain, it influences brain cell activity, and it's thought to be really important in stabilizing mood. In a small study in 1999, so a fair while ago now, it was found that individuals who were in love had similar levels of a serotonin transporter. So this is essentially a protein which is found in the body, which helps regulate the levels of serotonin. So there's not too much floating around, too little floating around. It goes around and like cleans it up. It was found that people who were in love had a similar level of this transporter in their blood as people who had obsessive compulsive disorder. So people with OCD, and this was compared to people who were not in love. And this led to a theory that essentially serotonin levels might be altered in people who are in romantic love to a similar level of people who have a clinically diagnosed condition, obsessive compulsive disorder. And this serotonin change in level might be what is driving people to become fixated on that person that they love. A more recent study in 2017, looking at the levels of actual serotonin in the blood, didn't quite find this same relationship in terms of serotonin being altered in people who were in love in the same way. They found that in men who were in love, the levels of serotonin were lower, and in women, the levels of serotonin were higher. So it's still unclear how serotonin sort of works in love and in this obsessive component that we get onto someone, but it looks like it could be involved. With obsession as well, something that is key with this is that obsession, can become a habit. The more you think about someone, the stronger the connections between brain cells that are associating that person with potentially feeling good about yourself and you're daydreaming into the future, which also feels nice. Those sort of loops get stronger and stronger connected. So the more you obsess, the stronger the obsession can become in a way. And this now brings us on to the honeymoon phase of romantic love. That is the phase where two people are just getting together and they are in that sort of bubble and it's at a really annoying time where your friend will literally disappear off the face of the earth for like three months because all they want to do is spend time with their new loved one. A brain scanning study looking at 19 people who were newly married just after they got married and a year later found some interesting things about this honeymoon phase of love. So in this study, individuals were put in a brain scanner and they were shown pictures of their loved one versus pictures of a acquaintance, so just a friend of theirs. And what they found was that when individuals looked at their loved one, there were different areas of the brain which were more active. And these areas included those involved with emotional regulation, those involved with attention, and also areas which we know are involved in reward. Our reward pathways, which are largely under the influence of a chemical called dopamine, are involved in, yes, making us feel good, but also in motivating us. Dopamine's release can essentially help to solidify actions which the brain has detected as being good for us. So being around an individual who we really love and care about, if there is dopamine release there from these reward centers, that's essentially saying to the brain that being around this person is good for us and that reinforces wanting to be around them more. Something else interesting in this small study was the researchers actually looked at the genetics of these 19 people who had just been married and they studied particularly four genes and these four genes all code for chemicals or their components which we think are involved in romantic love like dopamine and other hormones as well and what they found were some people with certain changes to these instructions were less likely to stay in romantic love for as long as people with different instructions now this was a really really small study but what this is essentially saying is that in our genes we are coding for all of these chemicals which are involved in love and if we have changes in these chemicals say for example we code for dopamine which could bind to receptors on brain cells for a tiny bit longer that means that dopamine is a little bit more effective at doing its job and that could mean you can stay in love for longer that's very hypothetical but essentially it's saying that how we feel love can also be orchestrated by the genes that we have inside of us and 
all of us have slightly different alterations in these genes and that might potentially predispose some people to feeling romantic love a little bit more. But this is a really tiny study. And finally, the phase that we have in falling in love is bonding. So after the obsession-driven romantic style love, this can transition into a softer, more trusting and stable type of love, which is called companionate love. And this is where two individuals are really bonded together. This type of love is often studied in animals called prairie voles. These are types of voles that form monogamous relationships with each other. So they will mate and then once they've mated, they stay mates for life and say the female vole passes away, the male vole will never mate again. They're very, very monogamous. And what has been found in studies with these animals is that the hormone oxytocin is really important for these voles to form bonds. Oxytocin in humans has been shown to be released in labor, in breastfeeding and during sex. But it's not thought that our reliance on oxytocin for forming bonds is as strong as in these animals. In these animals, if you manipulate oxytocin levels, it really does disrupt the animal's ability to make bonds. And also if these animals are addicted to other substances like amphetamine. So if the male is addicted to amphetamine before he bonds with a female, he's not interested in bonding with her anymore because he has his rewarding stimulation from another substance. But if these voles are already bonded together and then offered drugs, they don't want them. So in research, it's thought that having oxytocin floating around actually lowers our walls, if you will, and enables us to form these bonds with people. But there are many other chemicals probably involved, many other pathways, oxytocin binds to many different cells in many different organs. So its function is very complex. And so it's hard to boil it down to just oxytocin being this love hormone. But that is what's led to these sort of love drugs being created. And that was using things like synthetic oxytocin. You can get sprays as well, which essentially say like, if you have a nasal spray of oxytocin, this will make you more trusting and more open to bonding. And that is what the manufacturers I think have sort of jumped on and that's what they're using. So it really is not as simple as having this one hormone, which we've branded like this bonding hormone, giving it to someone and then they're gonna be bonded. And all of this information essentially brings us to the conclusion of it's really hard to study love and it's meant to be hard to study love because love is inherently complicated. If love was controlled by, you know, a few set hormones and that was it, then it would be really easy for love to sort of be wiped out because with reproduction, we acquire different mutations in our genes. So if it came down to a few hormones and all of a sudden those hormones through mutations stopped working properly, then that would lead people to not be able to fall in love. So it's really difficult to sort of pin down what love is in terms of chemicals. We also can't look in the brains of people who are in love except for using brain scans. So we can't look at these hormone levels and neurochemical levels actually in the brain live while people are in love. And the studies are always really, really small for these types of experiments because you've got to get people in a brain scanner and love is different for each and every individual because we feel love based on an accumulation of our different experiences. Love means different things to different people, how we've been brought up, how we've seen love. So trying to get a group of people who are in love versus not in love, that's a really difficult thing. But using some of the chemicals involved in love to make drugs, I mean, yes, that can do that. But we've got to remember these chemicals and hormones do a lot more than just facilitate some small component of falling in love. And there's a whole ethical debate around this as well. If we did have a drug that could make us fall in love, should we have that? Should that be available to us? Should we be able to give that to people and change how they inherently feel about people? Because love is such a huge influencer of how we behave. So there is a lot to think about if we could actually boil love down into a single pill which I don't think we ever will anyway. But that's it from me this week. If you enjoyed the video, then please feel free to subscribe to the channel and I'll be back with more neuroscience stuff soon. Bye.